we confuse extreme fitness and performance and what that looks like with health. Mm -hmm. We confuse the two. Extreme fitness and performance looks a particular way for sure, but health, longevity, and balance doesn't look like that. Let's swing it so far in the other direction that now we're putting obese individuals on magazines right. and we're saying that this is healthy, which it's not. It's It, it literally is the same terrible message, yeah. just packaged differently. And the reason why they're able to package it this way is because you've heard the other message for so long that the opposite message is almost like a breath of fresh air. No, it's also, it's the same thing. It's the same exact thing, just in the opposite direction. All right, everybody, especially you fitness fanatics, I hate to break this to you, but extreme fitness and extreme physical performance, it's not healthy. It does not contribute to longevity. Extreme! How dare you? I had this discussion uh, today on a podcast. I was interviewed by Chris, what's that? How do I say his last Gethin. name? Gethin. Mm -hmm. Love that guy. He's, he's a good guy. I just met him uh, today, in fact. And he asked me about how. And you're we, in we, love? I was just wow. going to say that. I'm glad you called me. I'm glad you called him out. <laughs> what did I say? I love this guy. I just met him. I just love him. <laughs> what I mean is, I like, I like him. Anyway, at first sight. We had a great conversation. We were talking about longevity and fitness. And um, it, you know, it kind of went in that direction. It's like, you know, strength is very healthy, but power lifters don't have typically great health or great longevity, right? Cardiovascular mm -hmm. endurance, very healthy. People who run, you know, a hundred mile marathons, not so healthy, right? Muscle, very healthy. Pro bodybuilders, not so healthy. There's a there's a, a crossover between fitness performance and longevity. But the more, the further you go in the extreme, the less longe the worse your longevity. It's amazing be. that this isn't obvious to everybody. Know. It, you know what it is? It, it's obvious to everybody that's not in that category. Yeah. yeah. You tell a, if you tell a runner that about bodybuilding and powers, they'd be like, yeah. Yeah, oh totally. yeah, those guys. Then are you crazy. say running them. Yeah. Oh no, well I'm not somebody who abuses yeah. that. You say yeah. you tell that to a bodybuilder That's about a power. Yeah, it's like whatever camp you're in, that your 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 belief system of the best way to stay fit and healthy, you don't you don't believe that you're the extreme yeah. version and, of that. And I want to say this because oftentimes what is promoted as pictures of health, if not oftentimes, probably not every time, is extremes. It's like, oh, look at this athlete. Look at this pro football player, baseball player. Look at this uh, this uh, Olympic athlete. This is healthy. What do they do for their health? And it's like, look, and, and I do want to say this too, like quality of life contributes to health as well. So if you enjoy lifting heavier than you should for longevity and it's something that you really enjoy, like that's great. And mm -hmm. that could that contribute to longevity? Maybe because of the quality, improving your quality of life. But the more extreme things go, the further away you move away from longevity and, and well, I think we just need to, need to communicate it. We need to tease out like the, the true specimens. Like I, I have no problem with portraying specimens in, in their particular sport or their particular pursuit. Like, you know, all the best, you know, for, for them at the highest peak of their performance, whatever it is. But we got to, we got to tease out that it's like health is a completely different pursuit. Right. And, and so, you know, I think that's where a lot of the articles and a lot of the stuff, like they convolute all that by trying to say that like, well, you know, they're only eating, um, you, you know, all, it's all carnivore diet or it's all like these extreme versions of things that are getting them to that to that pinnacle uh in in so your average person is like well i need to do that too or i need to do this this crazy high intensity workout every mm -hmm. single day um but literally like they're <laughs> what they're doing right now is completely different than what you're trying to do yeah no i did you i don't know if you guys saw i actually um i didn't know you were going to go this direction in the conversation I, I was real hesitant to post. Uh, I had a, a current picture of myself from vacation with my son, and I posted it in the the main IG. On, oh, I saw it. And and I I thought, you know what? I, I want to post this because I would consider myself in some of the worst aesthetic shape uh, that I've been in the last decade. Yeah, you're so hard on yourself, Adam. <laughs> no, I mean it's a fact. It's a, it's not. I know. It's not you, me being hard on myself. It's a fact. Yeah, it's but a, you look aesthetically. Good. I saw the picture. I know. What I know. You mean, but the, but that that was why I wanted to share it. Yeah. Right. Like I was hesitant because I'm like, well, this is like the worst shape I've been in in a decade. Like it's not something to brag about. But I was like, you know what? I want to highlight that this is this is what real life can look like, and I still would consider myself healthy and in pretty good shape, especially all things considering. If you think of my balance with work my balance with my family life, my balance as a father, totally. uh, my mobility, totally. uh, my my sleep. my you just If you factor all that in, you can make the case that I'm actually the, some of the healthiest I've ever been in my life, even though I don't look 
like the version of me just say six or seven years ago. And so that was the, that was kind of the motivation. And, and it's unfortunate because it's not um, like nobody, I guarantee screenshotted that photo and said, this is my, my I'm going to aspire to look mm -hmm. like this or be like that because it isn't uh, the extreme. It's not the, the, but if I, the, and the irony is if I would have posted the extreme version of myself and said, this is where I'm at right now, check it out. Like, I guarantee there would be all kinds of saves and shares on it because it's like motivation for people. Mm -hmm. But the reality is most people my age should probably aspire to be that version of me than the version of me six or seven years ago. It's it's a better quality of life for most people. It it's offers balance. You've got more longevity. I mean, being a body, but when you competed, how unbalanced was your life? Yeah, right? co completely. Yeah, and could you be the dad that you are without that kind of stuff? And, and would you even want to, right? So it's uh, we, we confuse extreme fitness and performance and what that looks like with health. Mm -hmm. We confuse the two. Extreme fitness and performance looks a particular way for sure, but health, longevity, and balance doesn't look like that. Usually there's extreme variances in individuals. There are definitely people that uh, they just, they're the, you know, 0.1% that look yeah. a particular way almost no matter what. That's not most people. Most people, it's, it's about balance and longevity and health. And, you know, to use another example, like one of the single, one of the best single metrics for all cause mortality is strength. Like, so you could take someone, measure their grip strength, which is a good general way to measure overall strength. And based off that, they can more accurately predict versus other single metrics someone's all-cause mortality. Now, does that mean that strength in extreme endeavors contributes to more and more longevity? No. Look at strongmen or powerlifters or people who pursue it to the ex absolute extremes. Yeah. At some point, it's this you, you get this negative result from it. Now, I, I'm not, I don't want anybody to feel like I'm hammering them if they enjoy doing that kind of stuff. I'm all about also quality of life. Like, you, you know, here's, a, here's the example I brought up on, on the podcast I did earlier. We talked about um, alcohol. There's very conflicting studies with alcohol, extremely conflicting studies. Like, for example, if you look at um, the island of Sardinia, where men live to 100 at rates that no, that there's no one else in the world that men live that long at that uh, proportion, right? And one of the practices that they have there that's pretty regular is they drink wine every night. Every single night they have wine. Now, we have clear studies showing that alcohol in any amount is unhealthy. Any amount is unhealthy. And yet we have studies showing that people who live a long time, often will have a glass of wine or two every single night. But how's that possible? Well, because it has nothing to do with the wine. It has to do with the quality of life that's yes, being improved. And absolutely. That, and that highlights how much that how much weight that carries in the, the overall totally. health sphere. Totally. So can um, pizza be healthy? Yeah. I think it depends on how you use it, how much you have it, and what you're doing with it. Alcohol, can all these things be healthy in, in, in terms of uh, longevity? Yes. So it's uh, it's it's much more complicated, and it's not the whole like, oh, that person looks shredded. I'll tell you what, right now, some of the unhealthiest people I've ever known mm -hmm. look the most shredded and the most mus muscular. Yeah, I I think this is a this is a tough one because of uh, how I've seen everything kind of turn in terms of marketing uh, into the culture, right? So there's been this sort of demonization of really fit people and like, you shouldn't even go in that direction, you know, and like a, these extreme examples that are just supposed to be examples of people within their respective pursuit. Um, you know, they kind of, I mean, we've, we grew up like idolizing like sure. the guys that were like jacked and huge and like, you know, body types that, you know, were unreasonable and unachievable. Um, but at the same time, like there was a little bit of a different kind of motivation with that versus, you know, now it's like, uh, it's almost, it's almost the extreme the other way. end of it. Right. Yeah, yeah. So now it's like all complacency, like, no, don't even try, Good point. you know, like just, so I get a little bit like, um, I mean, it's not that I'm like going against this message. I think it's, it's, it's just a, like considering that, um, there's a lot more, uh, factors in terms of lifestyle, in terms of health, in terms of like relationships, in terms of like you gotta you gotta sort of take inventory of all those different pursuits, and and where to pour you know your effort into each one of those buckets. And it's like it we're we're always trying to promote balance, and and that's that's where you, you're gonna live and, and thrive. I feel like best. I 100% agree with what you're saying, Justin, and I and I'm glad you brought that up because I do want to be careful about that either because I also don't. Want want to be yeah we're not promoting the other extreme because yeah. here, you know here's the thing the most dangerous part about the the living in those extreme places whether like 
Think of it the same way with living in the extreme dieting mm -hmm. place. What do we always talk about why that's so dangerous? It's the rebound. Mm -hmm. It's so you swing so hard the opposite direction. So one of the things that I was most proud of about my current state of my health slash physique where it's at right now is I was able to go on vacation for three weeks, literally not work out. I drank, I ate out, but I did it in, in, in a moderation that didn't allow me to go way overboard, which is what I would have done in the past. Mm. In the, my, my twenties look like this, um, the tip top shape version of me, which is single digit body fat, Adam. And then the extreme, like yeah, I'm on vacation all, all then I'm, yeah. yeah. Then I like put on all kinds of body fat and I'm in terrible shape and I'm eating like crap and over consuming. That was, that was a lot of my twenties was either I was in primo shape yeah. or I was completely out of shape all or nothing where what, what I think that I've, I've gotten better about is not living in the extreme so much because even though those extremes can teach us some things about fitness, about nutrition that I think are very valuable. The most dangerous parts about the extremes is they tend to cause people to go the extreme opposite direction also. Mm -hmm. yep. So that is the thing that I would caution people about. It's like, I think, I think, uh, I think competing like I did was one of the most valuable things I ever did. It, it, it took my, my consistency and discipline, my understanding of my own body and nutrients, uh, uh, macronutrients and what I needed for my body to look and feel a certain way. It took it to a whole nother level and understanding that I, I previously did not have until that. But the dangerous part about that, and it would have been if I would have ran into that at 23 or 24, because it would have caused a whole different like uh, body image issues mm -hmm. and extreme dieting back and forth, yo-yo dieting and stuff versus I went into it a much more mature and experienced trainer and knowing the pitfalls of those extremes. You knew, you were aware yeah. going into right. it. And you know the, the point Justin's making about what they're doing now is they've taken the pendulum and they said, oh, it's way too extreme over here. Let's swing it so far in the other direction that now we're putting obese individuals on magazines right? and we're saying that this is healthy, which it's not. It's It, it literally is the same terrible message, just packaged differently. And the reason why they're able to package it this way is because you've heard the other message for so long that the opposite message is almost like a breath of fresh air. Right. Oh yeah. Right. This is that was crazy. This mustn't be crazy. So the heroin looking at models, that's unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So, oh, thank God they're putting someone that's 300 pounds on the magazine. That's so much better. No, it's also it's the same thing. It's the same exact thing just in the opposite direction. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I, both I people next, both people have a very bad relationship with food. To, bad relationship with health. Yeah, period. That's I, it. I, I really hope the next extreme is going to be the middle that'd be great right yeah. <laughs> we've How done do both that? well yeah. that, that's the problem it's not an extreme it's not maybe yeah. it will be considered and that's that? a, and know. the reason why i think the other way is so marketable is because it is another extreme it's just another version yeah. of extreme it's the extreme opposite than the heroin addict skinny model look is like you're saying it's like so and and that's more extremes are marketable in the middle average is not and that i don't know if it'll ever will be maybe it will be when it's so not uh, typical, right? I, I was having this conversation yesterday with uh, my oldest. We were sitting for dinner, and uh, that show I talked to you guys about on Netflix. We were, I, you know, we were talking about it and joking about it. The sex room one. Oh, the sex room. And I was talking about one of the episodes, and we were laughing about it. just, oh my gosh, people are like really like different in what they're into, whatever. And my son goes, "What if?" In, he goes, "I bet you in the future, it's going to be considered really weird and kinky to like just have missionary sex." And I was <laughs> laughing. He goes, "Yeah, what if that's like the future? Like, hey, you want you guys want to do it?" Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm just going to get on top. Just like regular? Like, what? Regular? <laughs> you mean nothing else? Like, no weird? Like, you're not going to hit me in the face or do anything weird? <laughs> I mean, you, I, like, I wonder if that's going to happen. I mean, I would like to think that that's kind of how society works, right? Yeah. Where the initial swing is always the hardest. And then when it swings back, it's not quite as far. And then when it swings back, it's not quite as far. Like bumpers then, on a on a on a what are they, those lanes. Well, like, like, a, like a pendulum that's slowing down. You know, the initial when you swing that pendulum, it's going to swing as hard yeah. this way and as hard back the first two swings. I hope then so. the third swing, it's a little less. The fourth swing, it's a little less. And then it's just, and you get closer and closer to probably the center and more middle. I, I mean, I hope that's kind of, and yeah. I, I think that would, would look that way in most areas. So maybe it's not as extreme in, in the future. It's a, it's a little less, but, and maybe what draws it back to the more of the center is that, yeah, it becomes popular to be missionary. I mean, you see this like with tattoos, right? 
So in our in our generation, oh, yeah. in our generation, uh, you, tattoos were just starting to become like bef before our parents' generation. Tattoos was like prison. Dude, if you had one tattoo, you're yeah, like, oh prison, my God. Harley guy, motorcycle dude, bad boy. If you had a tattoo, and then it became very popular in our generation. And then it was like, oh, you're yeah, kind of edgy, you're a sensitive yeah. folk singer. Now guy it's like, oh, you're like a chef. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Then we went the whole way, and you know, tattooing your face and everything like that. And then now I see this younger generation. It's not as popular to be tattooed. Like so. You know, I, but yet, so some people are doing it, but I think it's less extreme. So, I mean, I, I yeah, think it took like tatting all the way over their face and everything to them. Be like, ah, you know, I don't think it's for me. <laughs> or or yeah. face implants. <laughs> yeah. You ever seen people with face implants? Oh, yeah. yeah. Like horns <laughs> under their skin and stuff? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I think, yeah. So, like, you bringing up the fact that, like, you learn uh, quite a bit from, like, the extremes. I think that there's potential there. And that's why um, it, it's good to pursue challenges and look at it like, yeah like a season or it's like, yeah. this is a period yeah. where I'm going I'm to pursue this. You just can't like live there yeah, because it doesn't benefit your body long-term. No, hundred percent. Right. That's, That's I, I think there is a lot of, I mean, I think there would be a uh, tremendous value in being an extreme runner for a while, then an extreme uh, bodybuilder for a while. And then an extreme power lifter for a while, for a while. Uh, like taking yourself to oh, you like I'm going to be very competitive about getting good at running. Oh, those are very, great challenges. Yeah, I think those are. I think I think there's a lot of lessons in there. You're going to learn a lot about your body along that way. But it. W but what tends to happen in our space is you marry an ideology, mm -hmm. and then I mean, and then you're looking at decades. I've been this yeah. power lifter guy, or decades. I've been this bodybuilder guy, or decades. I'm this marathon runner. It's mm -hmm. like. You know, I think there's value in all of those things and 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 learning the process of of getting good at those things and what it teaches you about your body, about health. And then I think you you if you've done a good job, you kind of find the balance. That's what the bodybuilding thing did. What the, the bodybuilding thing did for me is like I really became so hyper aware of, you know, how hard I was training in the gym in relation to what my calories needed to look like versus in relation to what my steps mm -hmm. and movement. I, I, I trained that so consistently for so many years that like when I was on vacation for these few weeks, I just, it was really easy for me to modify. I didn't say no to the drink with my friends at the beach. Like, okay, we did that. But then I was, I was aware that, Hey, I didn't get up till nine o'clock. I didn't train today. We haven't really walked around very much. I'm also not going to go overindulge on the dessert because I just sat here and had some alcohol yeah. and I want to make sure that I, you know what I'm saying? So I've, I've learned to. We only had candy one night the whole time. <laughs> the whole time I bought candy and Adam and I had candy one night. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I, you know, it's, I, I, in North, I mean, that's a thing. Like sometimes, yeah, you know, no, we I go know. places, Adam and I, of course. Yeah. Both, you know, well, so, okay. Funny you bring that up because, um, Mike and Ike. I have from our Cabo trip, I bought candy. Uh, I bought peach rings and I bought something else at the airport. Oh, I love peach rings, peach rings <laughs> and something. I can't remember what the other Doesn't candy was dirty though, but Hey, anyway. yeah, <laughs> I don't know why the, both those bags are still at my house right now. That would in my twenties, that would never you fly. Would just crush Cause it. yeah. Cause between, between between three and a half four weeks ago now it's almost been four weeks and to and today i w have already had multiple times where i craved that stuff where in the past i would indulge especially because i'm not being consistent with my training uh -huh. where now like i've learned to train myself that like i you know i definitely haven't earned the right to do that or else i'm going to be putting myself in a deeper it's hole. more enjoyable too with balance Absolutely. whereas the other way you're like go off you're like oh why did i do that yeah, oh i yeah. feel terrible my stomach hurts now same you, you overdo it and you, you yeah. just punish yourself boom what's up 72 hours left for the huge sale this just turned out to be the biggest sale we've done all year long only three days left for 50% off the RGB bundle. That's MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic, and 50% off MAPS Suspension. This is a suspension trainer program. By the way, I'm going to give those two things away for free right now. So one of you is going to get them for free, but you got to do this. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Click on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you, and you'll get the RGB bundle and MAPS Suspension for free. Now, everybody else, they're all 50% off right now, but there's only three days left as of the dropping of this episode. So if you're interested, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code JULY50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of like progress and, and learning and stuff, do you, have you guys been reading what they're saying about these this, these new studies on serotonin and depression? Oh, no. Did Jackie just send something over just the other She day? did too, and it's making its rounds, right? So this is ground breaking. In fact, really? the, the timing is perfect. I'm reading a book right now called The Body Keeps the Score, which very intense hmm. uh, read, and it talks about um, PTSD, 
trauma, how the body stores it, um, and our how the our medical establishment has viewed these things <clears throat> throughout the years. And the latest, I guess, way that we've looked at things like depression, anxiety, and stuff like that is that it's a chemical imbalance. So when Prozac was invented, this was the first uh, SSRI. Everybody was like groundbreaking, right? Here we we have a drug now because we thought it was okay. Serotonin deficiency. That's what's causing depression. That's what's you know contributing to anxiety. Here we have a drug that's going to raise serotonin levels in the brain, and this is going to totally help. And that changed uh, psychological medicine forever. So it, it went from talk therapy to psychiatry where it's prescription based. Mm -hmm. And now you go get all these different prescriptions. And this has been the model for Western medicine for a long time. It's chemical imbalances. You need this norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor or the serotonin re reuptake inhibitor or whatever, right? Well, the study comes out now showing it completely throwing shade on the whole thing and saying they don't think serotonin is really a contributor to depression. Now and that they've tested it many different ways in this, which is really interesting. Really, really interesting. Now, what I find really interesting about that is I have a very vivid memory of my psychology class my first year of college, and we had to debate whether um, SSRI drugs are worth it or not because they had already came out with studies that showed that they were getting the same effect with placebo. Mm -hmm. So the argument was, well, if it's helping them, should should we do it or not? And we had to debate that in class. Well, the evidence that they're showing now is that it may be more <laughs> numbing than anything. Um, which I guess can help in some cases, um, but it obviously doesn't solve the root issue. And I mean, I've talked about this before. Exercise mm -hmm. and studies outperforms uh, SSRIs um, when it comes to symptoms of depression. But boy, this is crazy because we've built an entire industry, decades long industry over this over these medications and the the theory that um, psychological disorders are chemical imbalanced or chemical imbalance uh, rooted. Mm -hmm. And in these studies that they, they did, they took people and they limited their serotonin mm -hmm. and not, n no, none of them became more depressed than other groups. And they looked at serotonin receptors. They actually found more serotonin receptors in people who were depressed, not less. Oh, wow. and then they looked at serotonin levels and then they raised them and lowered them, did all these different things. And it was very, it's very interesting what's coming out. Um, so I think there's some value, obviously, because people use them and, and find value, but they're thinking maybe it has more of a numbing value than anything else. And that in many cases, it may be do doing more harm than good. Obviously, I'm not a doctor, so right. you want to look this up yourself. And I do not, th this I do know, you do not want to go off medications because you read a study. You got to do it with a doctor because I think the, the, the I rebound- hate, I hate when that. stuff like this comes out. It just- it makes me more, even more skeptical about the, the, all the research and the studies and stuff that we all hang on to and we tout and and try and talk like in in certainties about nutrition yeah. and fitness. And it's just like, God damn, dude! Like it, every every time we think we know it all, like something comes out like that and disproves something Bro, that human, we believe to well, be true. People for are so decades. protective of a lot of these methods too, and like you know, may have their own anecdotes and things of, of success stories, you know, and like so the, to the to the numbing part of that i've heard that from some people that it's helped them to sort of at least taper it down by not feeling anything really as much uh but yeah i mean it's and it's frustrating because too you see this breakthrough science with like psilocybin and some of these <coughs> other means in therapies out there that you know are maybe unconventional but like you're like wow the success rate look at statistically like what's happening there. And it just does, it just doesn't seem like it's a big ship to steer. Well, you know, the research on um, psychedelics and therapy was, there was tremendous research, lots of research on it until it became, you know, part of public enemy number Ill one. Illegal, yeah. But there was a lot of studies in the past. Now we have a lot more, we have more studies now. Um, and I think there's, we still have to look deeper because I'm also afraid that people will think, oh, cool, I'm gonna go do some shrooms in my bedroom and right. I'm gonna solve my problems. I don't think it works that way. In fact, I know that they no, say that. No, you need the therapy. It doesn't it. work that way, right? But it, it is interesting with these uh, medications. And this book I'm reading is really fascinating. I mean, human psychology is so complicated to pretend like we know how to fix it with a pill is like so arrogant and ridiculous. It's yeah. just well, yeah. silly. And it's interesting too, because I mean, even if you had pain, like I, I remember like Courtney going in and, um, you know, was experiencing pain. And like their first answer to that was to give her like an SSRI or something. So you just don't feel like it solves nothing, like didn't get to the root, but it's an easy thing to like sort of prescribe. So that way it like sort of 
uh, has an immediate effect that can people also expect. Have, can also have scary side effects. Well, a lot of people gain weight on them, lose their libido, and then there's some scary side effects that are not very common. Listen, but. I feel like when it comes to the, the the drug business, we do enough studies to prove that there's some sort of positive benefit from it, so we can fucking get it out and and, and make it, money as long as it has. Well, who funds it, all the studies? I know if we have enough, we have enough studies to show that it has some sort of a positive benefit and that outweighs any sort of negative potential side effects. Yeah. And if that is it, it's green light. Well, well here's green. Green light, let's go. Let me give you, you know, seventy five percent of commercials and ad space for everything on TV is pharmaceuticals. And yeah. the irony of that is we're one of the only countries that allows that, right? Seventy five percent. Let me give you three examples. Okay. <clears throat> when artificial sweeteners first were invented, they said this is gonna solve obesity. We can now make food sweet with no calories. Obesity's worse. Okay. Uh here's example number two. Statins were invented. Drug effectively lowers the cholesterol. It really you take statin. Your cholesterol is lower. We are going to solve this heart attack uh, epidemic. No, didn't do anything to it. In fact, heart attacks are worse than ever. Now, we survive heart attacks more. That has more to do with the treatments that the doctors do when they go in after you have a heart attack or yeah, putting, putting stent. stints and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, in, right? yeah. Number three, they invent SSRIs. This is, and I remember when they first came out, there's a very famous Time magazine cover with like a happy face on it, the happy pill or something like that. It said, this is the chemical imbalance theory. This is the problem. Depression, worse than ever. So there's your evidence right there. So yeah. none of these things did anything to curb the growth of these problems. Why? Because they're far more complex mm -hmm. than taking a pill or doing one thing. Well, we're in, we're in the middle of it right now, too, with uh, medication for, for... We're starting to give kids, like, ADD medication. Starting to. I mean, that is an epidemic, bro. You're I giving know. kids meth, and it's like... I know. And that's... And, you know, again, something that we we, we claimed is going to help them or solve this issue, and it's not getting better. It's getting worse. Dude, I remember as a... Because as a, I, I got diagnosed with ADD as an adult, and I remember taking a stimulant, prescribed stimulant for the first time uh, as an adult. So I was in my 20s and they gave me a low dose of Adderall. I think it was like five milligrams, seven milligrams, considered a low dose. In fact, they'll start kids off on doses like five milligrams. And I remember taking it and as an adult, and I was like, they give this to kids? Oh, this yeah. is drugs, crazy. man. This is like, holy shit, this is crazy. And then I remember telling the doctor, this was way back, and then they gave me another medication that wasn't stimulant-based. And then I felt weird and loopy. Imagine your seven-year-old, you're giving them this. They don't have the words to describe kind of yeah. what's happening. All you notice is the kid's calm now. Right. And you're like, oh, this is working. So, I mean, again, I, I'm not a doctor, so I, I'm sure that there are applications for stuff like this. But, man, we take a, br a brush and we just everything, broad strokes. Oh, yeah, this is the solution. It's not the solution. And part of it is, is the funding. There are like try to fund a study or find a study that's funded with, with where where the potential outcomes lead to zero profits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's do a study on something natural where if it comes out that it works, nobody's well, well, and, money. Well, in there. the defense of science, uh, nobody's going to fund those. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, that's the only way they unfortunately get done. So. This is when I get pissed off with the people who are like the show me the study bullshit. Yeah, yeah. What study? Dogmatic about yeah. The what study? study? You know what I do? I'll do this. I'll look at old uh, practices, practices that have been around for thousands of years. Okay, well, why do they do this in Ayurvedic medicine? It's been around for a long time. There's obviously something there. Do they do something similar in Chinese medicine? Oh wow, they do. Is there something in a practice over here in the Western world that's old that matches it? Yes, there is. Okay, there's something to it. Like there's something to fasting, for example, because it's it, it's it's present in all these different you know uh, forms. Or there's something to activity, or there's something to talking your thing your 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 problems out. Really interesting. Anyway, in this book, it's really crazy. They, they, were, they were talking about um, they were doing uh, fMRIs on people mm -hmm. and having them relive their trauma. Oh my God. And to to see how the brain and uh -huh. they can all they can see in the brain is more or less blood flow. Okay, this part of the brain okay. is being active. This part of the brain is being shut off. Was there any commonalities with which parts of the brain were yes. being most active? So with the trauma, there's a part of the brain called the BRCA. I think I hope I'm saying it. Uh, part of the brain, which is responsible for um, using words to explain what's going on and in, in in your mind and what you're feeling and thinking. That part turned white. No oxygen, like it got a stroke, like it got turned off. Wow. So they say this is probably why some people don't even have the words to explain their trauma. Oh, wow. Or when, when people are in traumatic experiences, they kind of like just shut down. Yeah. And then yeah. you ask them and they're speechless. Like you, you know, the oh, whole yeah. like like a kid goes through something and you tell them, well, what happened? And they just, just don't talk. Yeah, yeah wow. can't describe All it they all. can do is feel. Mm. That part of the brain shut off and they can't communicate 
you know, what happened or whatever, which, which is one of the reasons why it's so hard. That's fascinating. really weird. Yeah. Really, really fascinating stuff. Speaking of, uh, you know, the brain and kids and stuff, having a little, having little ones, one of my favorite thing about having little kids is watching them develop um, and use certain skills and you can see them grow and learn how to like, how to lie or manipulate mom and dad or how to be funny when they need to be. Come up with dark jokes. Dude, uh, it's hilarious. Yes. So uh, Jessica sent me a video of Aurelius. He, he somehow got into the pantry. It's where we have like snacks and stuff or whatever. And she got the phone, right? The camera and she goes in there and you can see his face. Like, oops, mom found me. Right. And so then as soon as she sees him, he goes, bye mama. Bye. Like he's trying to tell her to leave. So she's like, Oh, you want me to leave? He's like, uh, uh-huh, uh-huh, bye bye. So she's not leaving. So then he's blowing her kisses. <laughs> Yeah. Like, this little manipulative kid <laughs> get mom to leave it so he could eat some of the snacks that's dude speaking to that like too so i was um i was just hanging out with the everett and he was he was trying to be funny it was like borderline not funny but like i could see how what his brain's trying to do right now you know and so he was trying to like uh associate uh so we have he, he was basically trying to describe like what like what like sequence we got the dog so basically like we kidnapped the dogs took them from their mother you know created our own family with them and meanwhile like they'll never see their mom like it was like super dark the way he's describing like how we we attain pets and then raise them ourselves <laughs> away from their own families and blah, blah. he's like laughing about it i'm like yeah, dude, that's, that's kind of how it that's is. Actually, that's actually very deep for him to be thinking that way, right? Like, yeah. he, most kids don't think about that, like that we have these, yeah, no, what that, we call that's pets. That's kind of cool. And, yeah, it's I, really cool. I was cool. tripping out on that, to be honest with you guys. I was like, like him thinking about that and like, you know, and he's like, and we, we give them a nice family home, but we literally like took them. Yeah, we kidnapped them. Yeah, we kidnapped them from, from their own, you know, family. Yeah. Like a, a, enslave them basically. Yeah. Like, whoa, 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 whoa! We didn't do all that, dude. You know, the you know, family. You ever learn about like why cats uh, <clears throat> meow and why dogs uh, bark when they're when they're adults? Because like uh, uh, dogs in the wild and wolves, they don't bark unless when they're puppies. Mm -hmm. uh, but our, you know, domesticated dogs bark and they you know they yelp and they you know they do certain sounds. It's because they evolved to act more like puppies as adults because we found it cute. Uh, yeah, that's what we preferred. Yeah, and uh, their features, yeah, their they, behaviors, we fostered. Yeah, yeah dude, they yeah. they totally evolved to like like that part of the evolution was like we're gonna make these these like apex predators like us a lot because they'll just take care of us. Yeah, oh, that's fascinating. They feed that's, us if we yeah. You know, yeah. talking about kids too. We uh, you know less of a kid, more of a young young man. Um, my nephew was in here today, and Justin was helping him out with um, some of his football training. He's a sophomore, and he's playing uh, playing football. And he wanted to get uh, some advice from Justin and I as far as like plyometrics and I was training. And I said, oh, man, this is a really good time. I said, Justin's in the in the thick of all this right now. So, you know, if he's willing to, to part with some of his time, I said, I, I would love to be able to get you with him. And then all of us kind of work together. And so we brought him in today and was teaching him some drills. And I mean, I know this is probably very normal for Justin because he's living in that world. But I forget, you know, like. Just the the mm. the body awareness that like those young oh, kids yeah. have, and it's like, <clears throat> and I, it also highlights to me um, how disconnected so many young uh, like athletes are with with coaching and and strength training and stuff like that. Because to me, um, it reminded me that he is the normal, and there's probably three to five kids on the team that most training drills that a lot of these coaches are doing really only cater to mm -hmm. because they have already the, the core natural ability. Yeah. The yeah. natural ability, the coordination. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Like, I mean, my nephew's done a really good job in the last year of like, you know, leaning out and, and building mm -hmm. his, his gas tank. And like, he's really, you could tell he's really wanting to get good at football. And then Justin has him in there uh, doing some drills and he's just like the communication of his upper body to his lower body is just not there. And so, and what it looks like, it looks like a baby giraffe, you know, trying to do these. He hasn't moves. lived in that body very long, has he? Yeah. I mean, he's, I mean, he's a sophomore in high school, yeah. but you can just see like as, as Justin and, you know, Justin has such beautiful form, right? He teaches a windmill or a box junk. And so a box, box jump Ooh, and box jumps. yeah, <laughs> and he just, <laughs> and sleep, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, and I'm, and I'm watching Justin teach it. And then I'm watching my nephew try and emulate it. And it's like, it's so far off. 
like in its it, uh, the most simple little details. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's great. Yeah, it's a, it's like a peer into like the last year or two. Like I've been trying to like really figure this out and like uh, uh, work my way back into that. You gotta mindset. have patience, man. Oh my god, and it's. Yeah, because you have kind of ideas of like where you want to take them, but then you see what they're capable of, and you're like, oh my god, I have to really peel back. Dude, how different is it training a kid versus someone who's older? Both cases have challenges moving, <coughs> but advantages and disadvantages of both. Very different. Yeah. Like, I remember the first time I trained a kid, I was like, oh, you can't do this, but for different reasons than yeah. why your yeah. dad can't do this. Right, right. Like your dad can't do it because he's tight and stiff and. Right. He knows how to tell his body to do it. It ain't happening. Yeah. You just don't know how to tell your body but to do it. If they're serious about it and they're disciplined, like the adaptation process is so quick. It's crazy. With these kids. Yeah, I'm really excited. I'm really excited to see if he takes the little bit of stuff that Justin was giving him and actually uh, applies it and gets better. But even his his dad with my my uh, my brother in law was was there watching it and uh, you know afterwards I said, Do you have any questions and stuff? And he brought up like, you know, I you know, I know he really needs to work on his foot drills. And it's crazy because it gave me the perspective of like a dad or somebody who doesn't know like what we're showing and teaching him. It's like, you know, it's wild is even though Justin wasn't teaching him all these foot drills, what you want to see come out of your son will come out if he actually practices these movements because yeah. mm -hmm. Justin's teaching him a, a proper windmill. You know, he's taught teaching him how to be on the balls of feet, how to do a, a, a single box jump, right? Yep. You know, the, the proper, you know, a movie illustrated that real well. Karate kid. Oh, yeah. the wax yeah. on, yeah. the wax off. Yeah, he's like, yeah. he wants to learn all this complicated stuff. He's like, no, totally. no just learn how to do wax, wax, wax on, wax off. Yeah. But Every, I mean, I everything has to be quality. Like quality is so much more important mm -hmm. uh, with each one of those attempts. And, and that's something that, you know, is fr it's frustrating a lot f from the perception of kids or from the parents because – um, they just want to get into the hype of it all and like, you know, get to, get to the crazy they hard workouts know. and yeah. And they just don't know that if you just spend that, that quality time, like sharpening each part of that movement and being, um, really intentional with every part of the, of that, that process, like what that is going to build for you later to, to then build upon it. Yeah. Well, it really, it really highlighted for me too, the discrepancy between the, the, the young kid on the team who's like the super athlete. And then, and then the kid who's like so far, seems so far behind because just like my nephew, he's researching all this stuff. Like he came to us cause he's like, he, like he found like plyometrics are supposed to mm -hmm. help me out. And he's like, uncle, will you teach me plyometrics? And it's like, well, yeah, I could show you these ice skaters and all these cool like plyometric moves that you could do, but he has his body's not even communicating. Yeah, we got to do this first, right? Yeah. And so, what ends up happening to probably a lot of these young athletes is you and why there. I think there's such a huge discrepancy between the superstar athlete and then kind of everybody else is you have this kind of genetic anomaly mm -hmm. who has got you know passed down genes from dad or mom who were super athletes, yeah, gifted motor coordination. Yeah, exactly, yeah. gifted proprioception, just understand great body co coordination and awareness, and then they find plyometrics and they find these drills and it just enhances them. Well, and then the whole, like you said, the whole uh, workouts and the structure from the coaches is geared towards those kids, which yes. leads everybody else, you know, to the side to try and catch up on their own. They're not getting any real, like, education and uh, means of being able to work their way into that ability. So it, and it's funny because, like, the way, like, I... I got things very easily, like with with my body in terms of like I could see you do something and I could mirror it pretty easily. That came naturally to me. And so that helped me a lot with athletics. And um, my experience as a new trainer was like the frustration of it was that um, people didn't have those <laughs> abilities. Yeah, just and do like, this. Yeah. No. So half my career literally is me trying to figure out how to articulate each <laughs> one of those and segment each one of those little pieces that, that that make the most impact to then produce what I was already naturally capable of this doing. This is when you start to learn how to communicate to your clients in ways that gets them to do what you want. So you're like, uh, okay, I keep saying pull the bar down to your chest and it's not working. Like, oh, uh, stick, bring your chest up to the bar. Yeah. And then it works. Drive right? okay. your chest to the bar. Yeah. yeah that, that's our, so I wish I knew. But, so I was in here being interviewed when he was out there. I had no idea what you guys were doing. I wish I knew because I would have brought him uh, the organ complex from Paleo Valley. We got a bunch of them in the back. Oh, yeah. And oh, for yeah. kids- that is a great, like, you want to talk about, 
like a natural multivitamin. Yeah. Especially for what kids need uh, with the B vitamins and the iron and all that you get out of organ meat, which you know, I actually didn't. Even, eating I organ actually organ didn't meat, even so. think about that. I stacked them up with some protein. That's well, why protein I, too, of course. Yeah, yeah, but I, I would have given him the organ complex. Well, I mean, maybe you can pick it up now if you're going to see him. Yeah. Well, he's going to start coming in here, so I will. I'll give it to him the next time he's in here uh, because he's coming. Well, we'll see, right? So basically, Justin and I gave him some stuff to work on. And said, "Listen, what we and here's the thing. Here's the challenge for him and I. Also, is that he's going to another school that's you know that's he's practicing with, and then also lifting with already. Oh, so the challenge we had not to add too much. Yeah, yeah. and and and, and that that's was like I was trying to. My brain was scrambled because yeah. it's like I'm I'm meeting with him at the very tail end of the opportunity to train into season. So he only has like a couple of weeks." And it's like the team's already mm. doing their thing. So how can we complement that? Yeah. And that's the other mistake that these young kids make. And I, I felt I had to communicate to him in the first like, you know, 15 to 30 minutes that he was there with us. It's like, I know right now, like you're super motivated to do whatever it is we'll tell you to do. And you just want to get better. But you need to understand that, you know, if Justin and I just take you through a bunch of like weight training drills right now that are supposed to be good for football and then you go and you practice on the field today and you also weight train today, we're doing you a disservice. Like you're just going to hammer the body so much yep. that you, and you, and you're doing more. So you think you should get better from it, but we'll actually potentially, especially if you. he's super like motivated and wants to work hard. Yeah. He, he it's is, a hard yeah. message. Dude, he looks great. Like last time I saw him, I was like trying to tell him, I'm like, man, and that's where I get excited because I can see like all this motivation is coming from him. It's there's no, outside influence cool. of like pushing him in that direction he he yeah. wants it yeah so. i'll go protein powder creatine if he's not already taking it and then organ complex that's what i would i actually understand. didn't think i thought creatine and protein powder but i actually organ complex didn't. you know that you know i think i know i've brought this up on the show you know that 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 organ supplements like uh liver tablets was a staple in bodybuilding oh it yeah. was a staple for a long time up until the that's 50s right. bodybuilders would take five to 10 desiccated liver tablets mm -hmm. with every meal. And they swore by the effects that they had. Was drinking cream and all that, was that before that with like the Eugene Sandow days or was that? Oh, like, no, they would also do that. Heavy cream, heavy cream milk, yeah, whole eggs, you know, all, all those foods. And they would also, the way they would get lean is they would actually watch carbohydrates. This was old time bodybuilders. Limit the, they would say, limit the starches and the sugars. And that's all they would do to get lean. Now they didn't get shredded, but they got pretty yeah. lean. You know, they got really Dude. Okay, so, so you have to talk about this bear serum because oh, yeah. I just did a little bit of uh, reading up on that article. Bear serum? And <laughs> <laughs> Sounds this, awesome, this right? This being the next kind of uh, um, crazy uh, performance. Oh, no, like deer antler? No, 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 no. Oh. This is legit. Now, don't, it doesn't exist. Stop, stop. Oh, no, it's legit. Okay, it here. doesn't exist yet, so everybody relax. It doesn't Go exist online <laughs> and look up bear serum uh, for muscle building. No, no, no. So scientists right now are studying... So bears, when they hibernate, which is fascinating how some animals hibernate, right? Yeah. Bears, when they hibernate, lose a very minimal amount very of little. muscle mass mm -hmm. uh, for the, especially when you, well, when you consider the fact that they're doing nothing uh, all for months, they're literally sleeping in hibernation for months. They come out, yeah. they lose a lot of fat. They should have atrophied. They lose a lot of fat, but the don't. muscle, I mean, it like sticks around. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to isolate what is happening in the bear's body that prevents this muscle loss while they're totally inactive. Mm -hmm. And so they're calling it bear serum. Like if we can figure this out and uh, put this together. Uh, fascinating. Then right. we may be able to use it on ourselves, which I, I the applications medically are huge, right? Like you're, you're bedridden or you're injured or you broke your leg. Yeah. Inject you with this thing, the ultimate muscle. muscle preservation. I don't know, dude. I think the I think the the pigs that adapt in in the from the wild from uh, from domesticated <laughs> oh, they get all hairy and tusks yeah. And <laughs> I think that to <laughs> me, there's more, more of aggressive. A that's way more progressive. You know what I'm saying? If you could all of a sudden go from bro, being a domesticated that's like a pig, werewolf serum is what yeah, that bro. That's being. like yeah. you know what I'm saying. All of a sudden you grow tusk. Imagine yeah. what that could possibly well, do. I don't for know, you. man. You put a, put put us in the wilderness, and if we don't die because we don't know what the hell we're doing, I think we'll look pretty different in a couple months. We'll probably <laughs> look like the wild beard. <laughs> in our hair yeah, is, oh, uh, Lord of the Flies I survived but yeah so if they can identify this it'd be pretty uh, it'd be pretty rad yeah, yeah I know. that's I interesting that. plus it's from like, a bear right? that's interesting a, that's yeah. a cool animal dude speaking of uh, weird shit dude I have a video I think I sent it to the group I don't know if Doug can pull it up so you know how they have um, they're making these like autonomous you know machines and one of them looks like a dog and it walks around and you've seen it before yeah, yeah, right yeah. where they jump on Boston things Dynamics bro they put a machine gun on one and a shotgun on one 
And this little thing. I mean, did you ever question I mean, that was of like? Of course, the I knew that was gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, it's dude. just the natural I mean, progression. But right. Like, oh no. The, the first plate. I mean, bro, it's fucking terrifying. You gotta well, watch the video. I know, but okay. Let it's me like see a the, dog walking around. Let me see the video. Now, isn't I mean, isn't what funds most of this stuff like for military purposes? Of course, sure. Yeah, I was gonna say Boston Dynamics. All that stuff is, I think, for military purposes, right? So can I? That's where we'll. That's the application. I wonder if here's. I'm imagining a war of the future, right? A war of the future would be machine versus machine. And then once the machines are destroyed, is the next level now human? You know what I mean? Like, what do they do? Remember, yeah. okay, if you go far enough back when we 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 on um, mind pump, I theorized that it would be like video games. Yeah, but what if you lose in that? Does that mean you lose? Yeah, you're, like, like, you lose over. like you're champions, right? Yeah, like, like to do nobody's back. gonna agree to that though. Yeah, what do you mean? You're not gonna if okay. Oh, we lost. Oh, great. Okay, listen. Now China yeah, runs listen. America. <laughs> no, we're you, okay, listen. If you think about a it, us as an evolved species, look at look at look at look at. It's good. It's a freaking dog with a machine gun head, bro. Yeah, it's, that I've sucks. That. It's crazy. You yeah. imagine that thing just coming out? Listen <laughs> though, if you think of, you think about uh, okay, there was a time. Okay, think about this: when we used to go to war and we would line up ten yards from the other guys, blast each other. Yeah, and blast each other like yeah. that. So we've obviously progressed from that, and it's gotten it's gotten more and more it's, separate and distant. Uh, why would we not eventually progress to a time where we agree that like? Why we can have this disagreement? Because that's the opposite of, of the way that war progresses. The wars progress and become we become more efficient at killing. More destructive. We don't go, we don't go in the other direction. It goes in the direction of yeah, like it, it used to be harder I mean, to kill someone. You have to deal if if that was the case. Like you, there's less destruction, but there's more like so. It's like in the virtual setting where you're like disputing it. Well, what like, if that's what what future like a uh, like I, peace I, treaties look like? The, I just the don't peace see treaty it. in the future is this. Listen, we're not Who, agreeing. Whoever won Mario three, <laughs> yeah, 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 dude. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. You know, say like I don't know because it, you still are. You're still battling in a sense because it's it's our our, wish, bro. our intelligence that built that our strategy that has to go to war and do that with these machines. I wish, but could you imagine? I do do, do you really think we case. would do that? Like, let's say we go to war with China, and we're like, okay, we agree to a virtual war. Whoever wins wins the war, we and then we do it. By China. You think <laughs> <laughs> they win all the games? They win all the games. Dude. All the video games. Dude. We get our asses. <laughs> hey, We're so fucked. Hey, this is but a bad just, idea, you guys. But hold on. Maybe that's why. Hey, yeah. the U.S. will be the reason why we don't do that. No, that's not yeah. true. Yes, it is. No, dude. we have the best. We have yeah. some of the best video game players. I mean, too. They happen yeah, to be from China. Okay, but they're I, think, in the <laughs> I think Korea <laughs> would kick everybody's ass. What's that? Was that meme that the spelling bee? No, it was like the math champions. Yeah, the math. The U.S. math champions, and they're like they're all Asian kids. Hey, that's America, bro. America is everybody anyway <laughs> i can't imagine another country losing and be like oh we lost you guys win they'd be like nah fuck you i know we lost but let's just we're not yeah, gonna but, do what you but say also we still have missiles yeah, yeah i don't see that happening at all uh, at all but uh, the, but it's it is kind of terrifying to see there was a black mirror episode where there was like a uh ai dog that was like chasing someone around oh, and trying I to kill saw him. that one well that shit's gonna happen well what dude. do you think though i mean in terms of like we we created space force right for a reason and there's lots of uh satellites and you know this protective kind of zoning of now of like beyond Earth. Like, like how are we going to manage people from occupying the moon, for instance? And then you know if we keep expanding our way out. Well, the way we did what does that it, look like we, I the know way, there's a treaty, but yeah, and the who's treaty hold is, up to that. Nobody puts a, a like a base on the moon, but that's because if you do that, that's a declaration of war. So if you do that now, we're going to war. So if a country does that, they're basically saying they're going to war. Right. But an agreement where we're like. Hey, if you if your favorite champion beats our favorite champion, then we'll give in and you guys win. I don't think that'll happen. I think we'd lose. I don't think we would accept it. Would you accept it? Oh man, we lost. Now we're communists. No, <laughs> everybody be like, man, okay. nah, nah. nah. your social credit system yeah. Yeah. Uh, to deal with. Sorry, I know we lost, but we give it. Yeah, we're we're taking it back. You guys have to come in here and fight us now. Well, I, I don't think. Gonna, okay, so that's fair. That's a fair point. Yeah. Like, if someone tried to conquer us and take over our land, and mm -hmm. we and that we like, I don't think we would stand for that. But that the, the, the conflict is normally not over that, right? It's normally over trade or goods or that it, always escalates, dude. I, but that's just it. Depends it, it, on it, who's it in escalates because we don't power. have like a a a, a more um, you know less aggressive way to settle it. Like if we could just say like if it was like over trade, right, or tariffs or something like that. It's like, it's like, we're going to enforce these tariffs. No, you're not. We're going to go to- You know what might work? Well, I got an idea. What might work, this would never happen, by the way, but let's just say the whole world was in on it and they said, okay, and they were the referee. So, and it's like, you know, it's like one country against another and then they have to go in this virtual world. Whoever loses, loses. But if they go back on it, now the whole world declares war on the loser. Hey, you didn't follow the rules. I'm sorry, but- 
But even then, I, okay, I'm going to use an American example because I know Americans. I am an American. <clears throat> We're, we get in a, a virtual war, and the whole world in, is the referee, and we agree. All right, if we lose, we'll give in, <laughs> and we lose. Um, you know what we're going to say? No, Sorry. We, we, we're not going to give him. I didn't sign that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, oh, and depends, by the way, we okay, all have guns. So it depends on what, because like you said, bringing back to like, we're not going to give in and then say, and then become a, a communist nation like that. If that yeah. was the war, like, oh, China's saying, hey, we're going to, we're going to go to war with you in this virtual world. If we win, we get to, yeah. we get to dictate you how your country's ran. Like, no, I'm thinking it's over more, you know. More. You know, in the past, there have been situations like that just to avoid greater carnage. But mm -hmm. on a large scale, it's never worked. But there has been in the past, like duels. You know, back in the yeah. day, yeah. you had families that hated each other. And instead of going out an all-out feud where they kill each other, like one guy walks up to the guy and says, all right, let's do a duel. And then that'll end it. Now, sometimes it didn't. Sometimes Wasn't it, it you guys I was watching, they still do that over like in Ireland or whatever that with oh. like families? Oh, you mean the, what are they oh, called? The, 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 knuckle, yeah, the, the travelers? Yeah. 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 You got, a, you got an issue with gypsies. another family? But it, it, they kept going back and forth though, even them. And it, it spurred a murder in one of them or whatever. Yeah. So mm -hmm. even then, I don't know, man. Yeah, <laughs> human behavior. We're back yeah, to human behavior yeah, again. Yeah. We're not the greatest. Oh, no. It's hilarious. Uh, hey, speaking of uh, of behavior and weird changes and stuff, is it true that BMW is going to? This may be a sign of the time, a sign of the times in the future. They're going to start charging you a monthly fee for your heat seater, your 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 seat heater. Excuse me to work. So okay, I I heard this. <laughs> what? I know. And I actually think this Nickel is the- Nickel and dime the hell out of us? Yes. I think this- Okay, listen. Does EA own BMW all of a sudden? One of the most brilliant, one of the most brilliant services I've ever seen created is uh, dog kennels now that have these cameras on your dogs the entire time, and you have all these a la carte options that you can do at when you want to do it, right? So you, you pay your $25 a day to have your dog stay here, but then if I want a, a tummy rub- for my dog at three o'clock in the afternoon, I can pay three dollars. <laughs> if I want my dog wow. to go for Are you serious? a play date with another dog, I can pay four dollars. Yeah, this is and, this all, and and you have control. You can watch and everything like that, and it's brilliant. Right, because parent, because you know, dog owners are doing this like crazy. And then they, if they don't want to, they just want the service. They can be those people too. Yeah. And I think the future of these cars, especially like Teslas, BMWs going this direction now, is you have a base model car that you pay only a certain amount of money, but then all the upgrades are controlled digitally that they can also do. Oh, you want your self-driving automation uh, upgrade to your car? That's all a cart. You can run it just one Dude. time and use it for this drive. And so it's uh, $17. Are you sure this was an Apple's idea? Because, dude, they... Oh, they always do that with their products. Like, well, I wouldn't no be surprised. Just Remember, I told you like Apple. I told everything. you Apple, Apple CarPlay is going to be one of the most revolutionary. Yeah. Well, things you know that why we this is. is you know why so this annoying. is so weird to me is because it's never been this way with your seat getting heated. Yeah, yeah. but there there has it's been an expectation. But, you buy I mean, you it. have well, to pay for it. When yes, you buy the yeah. car exactly. Yeah. So think about it. Like, okay, what you're reading into right no, now. No, you say makes sense. Will that lower the price of the vehicle? Yeah. So you would buy it. So this would now become a a baseline BMW that option that can be upgraded for a monthly service. Uh, okay, that makes more so sense. So like that. So that's Bro, what, what if it's like this? What if you could pay to like get the 500 horsepower that you want? That's going to happen too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, because it's all driven a lot by the chips anyway. Bro, and it's, so it's this is like so upload. what's going to so happen. Be with, yeah. You're going to be like, oh, oh, I'm going to pick when up. When you have, upload. You're going on a date, you're like, oh, I'll pay Tesla, the upgrades. <laughs> you see how Tesla, like right, the, the, the latest <laughs> Tesla Model, Model X, has done that already where a, a new upgrade comes out and it automatically boosts your, hor your yeah. horsepower by 20, yeah. 30 But horsepower. do you have to pay for it? Or no, it's, it's just like that's automatic, built, right? Okay, that's, but that model, uh, like a year or two ago, it's guaranteed in. But I do believe that they're going away from that, that the upgrades you will have to pay for. Actually, so, now that you explain it like that, it makes a lot of sense because if you can lower the price point of entry for yeah. getting a vehicle and then like as they uh, acquire more money to, I mean, it's, you it's know brilliant. What yeah. yeah. And, and it, it's, it's accessories, it's a, it's accessories. A, it's, a, it's a win for the consumer and it's, a, and it's a win for the business. Yeah, it makes sense. Because they can then get you in at a lower entry level and so you're like, oh, I can own a BMW now because mm -hmm. it doesn't have all these options. But then when you want those specific options, you can uh, uh, choose to have those upgraded in can, there. Can you, now, now I don't know about you guys, but all I can think of right now. So when I was when we were kids, remember how you had to pay extra for HBO and Cinemax and pay per view, and then remember how you could buy a box, oh, and yeah. put it on your TV. And well, there'll always be hackers. Bro. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking right For now. Sure. There's going to be a black market where you bring Possibly. your- Possibly. They all get the base model. Why are you scratching your head, Doug? 
Well, I mean, if you wanted heated seats in your car, they have to put in the mechanisms to- Already allow, built in. Already built in. So that's an expense. So you're going to pay for that when you buy the car. Well, they so don't give you access. So you're essentially paying for heated seats when you buy the car because yeah. they have to put in the mechanism. Yeah. And now you're paying a subscription on top of that. Yeah. Doug's right. Well, I think that well, the, or they factor that in and they don't give you access to turning it on. That's, well, yeah, but they still how, have to have the mechanism, which or, is an expense. Or what happens, Doug? Yeah, they're going to have to wrap that in the total or, price. Or because of the subscription services, that offsets the cost of sure. putting them in the car. Yeah. So they can lower it for people who don't use it. That's what I would think might work oh, out. Well, of course, BMW is going to make more money doing this or else they wouldn't do it. Yeah. yeah. Or they're gonna okay. test of course. It. They're going to test it. And see I'm sure they are. I can see hackers, yeah. though. I, I'm all about, like, if I buy the car and I own it, and I don't have to take it in like as a lease and they, whatever. Pff, I'll take look, the base. Hey, so you're how, thinking it may end quickly, up being like a wash. Look dug, how quickly like, Apple trained all of us to lease our phones. You know what, though? That's I because know. it was a new market. Imagine if we... See, the thing about car market is that's such an old market that you're going to have to retrain the consumer. You know well, what I mean? Heated like, seats are not, are not an old market. That's a new market. Heated, heated seats? seats have not been around that long. They've been long enough to where if you have it, you have it. Like, no one's ever had to pay a subscription service for it before. Oh, I mean, there's probably a lot of people that don't have heated seats in their car right now, bro. Well, look. Not every fucking... They were talking about BMW. It's a luxury car. Here's why I'm, I kind of agree with you. Because people buy bottled water. Like, like yeah. that was a joke. Literally, 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, it would have been a joke if you said you could sell everybody to buy water because it was free, basically. And now everybody buys bottled water. So I, that's why I kind of agree with you. I could see... I change. just see where the, where the the... Okay, our cars are becoming more and more like computer systems. 100%. And, it's a, and, it's a and, tech piece of tech. Yeah. Yes. They're becoming more and more like a piece of tech that from from away from the car, somebody else, a hub, can add or take away things. And so it only makes sense that we would move into this direction of here's your baseline vehicle that you paid for, and then it has all these potential things that you could turn on whenever you want, and then you pay a la carte. Yeah, that makes sense. I could see it going in that direction. Did you see in Europe? I don't know what country it was. They passed a law that said any cars sold past, I forgot what the date was, has to be have be speed limited so that they can't go faster than the speed limit, which makes Logical sense, just on a consumer basis, though. I can't imagine consumers wanting that shit. No. I always thought that as a kid. I'm like, wait a minute, they could put a speed limiter to make it go, not go faster than 130. Why can't they do it to 65 so nobody speeds? That makes sense, right? And I think they would just crush the <laughs> the ticket market or whatever. The That's exactly uh, yeah, who wants that do. car. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but 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 I, there's countries. The uh, and I forgot where it was in Europe. They were passing that. So with with cars like this, I could see that. Of course. Where now the government's going to step in. It's like, oh, you can't accelerate past this point. You can't go past the speed. If you get pulled over, police has access to your car. So as soon as they want to pull you over, they will push a button, stop your car, and then that's well, it. Well, you, you see now, too, the, what insurance- I'm going with like hot rods. I'm going the opposite so I'm, I'm going to buy a horse. Yeah, you yeah, see yeah. what insurance companies <laughs> are doing. Well, your car insurance companies are doing now, too, where you have this like adjustable car insurance based off of how you drive because yeah. you, they can now track all your driving patterns. Yeah. How often do you speed or the speed limit? If you stop at stop signs, like how often you actually drive throughout the day, like all that stuff gets, mm. it, it's, it's thrown into an algorithm and spits off like, oh, this person should only be getting charges and then you'll be able to get a kickback yeah. on your insurance. Speaking of tech and stuff, I am trying trying to find a way to put PRX in my garage because I have an old rack in there. Yeah. But in the garage that that I have, the, the walls have a bunch of storage cabinets and the back wall has got um, some pipes and stuff. And so I don't know where I can put the PRX uh, cage, but I, I'm, I think I may take off some of the side storage because I can't use my garage. I don't yeah. park any of my cars in the garage. I, I just have my gym in there. That's such a- I'm so... It's so, so mad about I'm that. So, I know. I'm so disappointed in you when I see yeah. that too. And I, hey, man, well, I, was, I was looking <laughs> no, at your car. I was looking at your car yesterday. Amazing racks. Yeah, first yeah, of all, yeah, first yeah. of all, park out here in this parking lot over here for uh, whatever reason. I, know. I don't know what plants they have out there. I don't know. There's something oh, over two there. seconds after they're washed, I they're know. covered in, know, in pollen and stuff. So I don't know. But yeah, I, I, yeah, but I want, I want, I want that rack in the in my garage because I can't use it. I can't yeah. use it. If I had a PRX, I'd be able to use it. I could fold it in. Well, one cool thing I saw that they did because there was like a problem with like the the models where your ceiling wasn't quite as high. So say they're like eight foot, not like the yeah. ten foot like clearance. Like that's what happened in my old house, and it was it was a bummer. I had to like I didn't realize that uh, I had to like send it back because I couldn't pick it because it has to go up to be able to go mm -hmm. into the wall. Uh, so what they did, so I couldn't get the one that had the the pull up bar oh. attachment. Uh, so now they actually have like uh, engineered like a, a way that you can you can bolt that into the wall so you can still put your rack up but then you keep um, the actual attachment 
on the oh, wall okay. for your your pull ups. Oh, that's cool. So th- it kind of solves that problem if you have like lower I ceiling, also, but you still want to pull. I also more. like that they're I like their rack better than a standard case. I stable. do too. It's, it's more stable. A way more stable. It's yeah. the most stable it's rack so, I've ever used. I'm, I mean, I remember being so skeptical when we first started working yes, with them, like going same. like. Am I gonna like this for yeah, like Am I gonna squatting? load three hundred pounds on this and make yeah. it feel like I'm gonna, yeah? And you know, shame on me for not like like it's very it's pretty basic physics when you think about everything that's attached to the wall plus the support of the mm-hmm. arms when it comes down. I think it's stable as shit, dude. I and I love the fact that it literally. I mean, that's how much it takes up in my garage. Yep. Mm-hmm. I, so yep. I can fit my truck in the garage, which is super long compared to the other cars. Like, and you have a full gym. Yeah. I love that, man. I mean, I, it's it's for sure been one of the one of the best inventions as far as garage gym stuff that to be because that's one of the. I mean, forever I've always been hesitant about building a, a garage because I, our gym inside my garage because I've always wanted my cars in there. Yeah. I I love being able to pull into a garage and be out of the weather and and have your car in there. Plus, I, I don't know if you guys have ever had a time in your life where you've had a car for a long period of time that never was garage and then a car that has been garage. It The longevity of your car oh, of when course. you park in the garage yeah, is crazy different. Yeah. Like it, you park a car out I mean, your all- paint job and everything yes, else. Yes, all the, the time. Oh, it. the interior. Yeah. I mean, it just wears on a car yeah. being beat down by the sun all day long and all the weather. Yep. Versus being parked in a garage, I swear you get like ten more years out of the vehicle by just parking every day I in a know. garage. So I'm trying to figure out how I can put that in there. Hey, check this out. Look, I'm a dad, and I'm also a health and fitness enthusiast. So my children's health is very important to me, especially my young young children. So I have a a almost twenty month old child, and I got a baby on the way. And uh, when I give them baby food, I go to Serenity Kids. This is the best stuff. So it's the nutrient dense. There's no sugary fruits. There's healthy fats. They're ethically sourced meats, bone broth, purees. They have grain-free puffs, meat and veggie pouches, uh, A2 whole milk toddler formula. Like This is like the best stuff you can give your kids. Healthy, high protein, uh, no grains in a lot of this stuff. It's good stuff. It's the only baby food I give my son, and I'm going to give my infant uh, daughter when she's born. Go check this company out. It's the best. Go to myserenitykids.com. That's M-Y-S-E-R-E-N-I-T-Y uh, kids.com. And then use the code MP20, MP20, for 20% off your first order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first question is from Bill Cutmore. How long does it take to build muscle mass? Oh, approximately 13 years. <laughs> yeah, very specific number. Roll it Let's tough. get it. You know, um, now, all things being equal, meaning you have an appropriate, effective workout program and a good diet, um, good sleep, like all things being equal, your genetics play a huge role in how quickly this can happen. So it's a very tough question to ask. But generally speaking, it's a slow process because uh, you are asking your body to add or to increase upon its uh, requirements for energy. In other words, it's going to need more calories, going to need more nutrients, and your body doesn't do that willy-nilly. Also, generally speaking, you tend to build muscle faster when you first start working out than later on. So you get this like real quick response. A lot of people refer to that as newbie gains. And then it really starts to slow down. And the longer you work out, the slower and the harder it is uh, to add muscle. But from it's, person to person, boy, this could vary. Man. It's not only a really slow process. It also requires uh, consistency with the diet and the training yeah. for a very long period very of time. Long All the components aligned at once. I yes. Mean, that's, if you're like in that sweet spot where you have everything, like your recovery is super on point, like the amount of stimulus you're providing your body is is adequate for, for you to change, uh, your hormones are balanced, like, like uh, you know, you're – there's just so many the nutrition and all this stuff. So like, yeah, if, if, if everything is stacked, like completely perfect if for, and you're stringing that out for a, a period of time, that's, um, you know, uh, super consistent. Like that's, that's when you're going to see results a little bit quicker. Yeah. But you have to, so what do you, when you, when you guys think of someone like this, who asked a question like this, what do you see are like some of the, the most common pitfalls or mistakes that a person like this normally makes in pursuit of that, right? I get a young guy who's like, oh, how fast could I pull 20 pounds of muscle or whatever? And they want to know like all the- Well, it's either inconsistency or it's overtraining. Yeah. Right? Those and, have to be the two biggest ones. Right. And that's exactly where I was going was I, 
so and this is the mistake I even made as a, as a young kid trying to to build muscle too is that you know I I didn't realize how important it was for me to every day in day out be hitting my protein intake and then also being in a calorie surplus a majority if not all the time and then also being very consistent with the workouts and when one or two of those things are not consistent you could literally go a month or two of training and see very little to no progress or backwards yeah the, the what people need to realize is that your body's always in a muscle protein breakdown stage where you're losing muscle or in a positive uh you know protein synthesis stage where you're adding muscle and the process of building muscle is essentially when the positive protein synthesis outweighs the negative. So mm -hmm. even if you build muscle, it's not always that you're building muscle. You're still going through processes of losing. It's just that the building outweighs the losing. So that's kind of what it looks like. Also, it's you don't build it's muscle. It's not linear. It's not a consistent linear thing. If you were to look at, like you take somebody who worked out for five years who gained, let's say, 15 pounds of muscle, if you looked at when they gained that muscle, it looks like blocks of time. Like, oh, here's where I gained three pounds and then nothing for a while. And then, oh, I gained another one and then nothing for a little while. So it's not like this, I you know, I gained 15 pounds over the course of two years, which equals out to a quarter pound of muscle every week or whatever. It doesn't work out that way. It's like a spurt of, of growth and then plateau and maybe some going well, backwards. Even then you get challenges if you have like these big periods of growth, because now you have to be able to support that growth. Right. right. You know? And so like, if you're just applying the same hammer to get you more growth, you're going to run into problems where it's like, okay, now my joints are screaming at me and my ligaments yeah. and everything else are, are, you know, like too, uh, you know, tensed up and, and there's too much demand there. So where I need to reinforce that. So now my focus has to be elsewhere to be able to support this to then add a pawn of what I ever uh, received. So to your point, Sal, this is one of the reasons why I, uh, I like this like psychological game that I've, I, I play with myself when I'm trying to sound really bad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> my delivery what was do you really, play with yourself yeah, <laughs> yeah. the psychological game is not me playing with myself it's literally <laughs> wow. me challenging He's myself like I put on a wig yeah, yeah. I as it mirror, as it yeah. rolled off my that tongue i caught it's like damn that didn't sound that didn't sound the way i wanted it to sound uh it's okay we all do it no i i i I, I challenge myself with it because i know how important the consistency with the workout is i know how slow the process is and i know how important the consistency with uh, the diet portion is that all three of those have to be aligned and consistently aligned. And the reality is that many times in a, in a journey towards a goal like this, one or two of those things fall off here and there. So I, I, I challenge myself this way where I say, okay, I diet and training, uh, all, all going to be consistent. Uh, and I'm going to try and be perfect for X amount of days. And I start with small goal this week, you know, this week is going to be a great week. And so, and then maybe I have a day where, oh man, I didn't hit my protein intake. And, and, and to your point, I'm going backwards. I'm either, I'm either building or I'm, or I'm, or I'm losing. If I don't hit my protein intake, I miss day training. I'm going the opposite direction. I'm not building and my, I'm not sending the signal. I'm not building at that time. I'm going the opposite direction. If I always want to be progressing, I need to keep stringing more of these days. Okay. So I made seven days. The new goal is eight days. Can I string now eight perfect days in a row? And then I go, oh, maybe I, I not only go eight, I actually carried it all the way to 17 days. And then I have my first, you know, day of missing nutrition and my first couple days of missing the gym. Oh, shoot. Instead of beating myself up. Okay, now 17 was the new record. Let's see if I can beat that. Let's see if I can beat yeah. that. And I just keep playing this, this game of challenging myself with being more consistent with that stuff. And then that's to me when I started to see like the muscle starting to pack on because I was starting to string more and more consistent blocks of not missing on my nutrition and not missing on my training. Right. And then it started to compound because if you go into it like, oh, I heard that you can gain, you know, eight to 10 pounds of muscle a month or whatever like that. And then you, and, and, or you do the other angle, which is like, well, then I'll do more, you know, I'm going to train harder and hopefully it's all about intensity. And you think that's the way you're going to build more muscle. You get stuck in these traps and these plateaus that you can't get out of. And you can't figure out why, because yeah. you're working hard. Now, my experience, Experience. I'd love your guys' input on this. And I'm going to refer to the, this is the average person. So I'm not talking about the the freaks, right? The genetic freaks. Uh, so the average person, I would say for a man, on average, doing most things right, okay? Most things right, working out right, eating pretty good for the most part, getting good sleep, 
appropriate training intensity volume. I would say the average man could probably gain anywhere in the first year of training, anywhere between, I don't know, maybe 10 to 10 to 14 pounds of muscle, something around that, right? For the first year, if they do everything right for a full year. For a woman, it's probably around four to eight pounds of muscle in that first year. Would you guys say that I that's- would, I think that's yeah. super accurate. You think that's pretty accurate? I think, pretty it's, I think it's super accurate. And don't be discouraged if you're a, a young guy or girl who is wanting way more than that because- the difference That's the of, first year, by the way. Yeah, After and, that, it ain't happening. And like also, that. 10 pounds of lean body mass, it looks really different oh, on yeah. your body. Yeah. Okay, so, and, and the likelihood, if you gain 10 pounds of muscle, you probably also put, you know, three to five pounds of fat along the way. So yeah. now you're 15 pounds. Well, that's where those 20 pound, you know, like, we'll, we'll get that sometimes. Uh, like, I gained 20 pounds of um, you got to just decipher like what was lean mass versus like, you know, what you actually packed on to yeah. that was. And fat, there's also there's water. I could, I could make my body now, right now I've already done this. I can make my body weight fluctuate by five to six pounds of water very easily. Yeah. Very easily. And when I have the extra six pounds of, of water, I feel bigger. My muscles feel more pumped. It feels like muscle, but I know it's water. Well, you're also, it's really important to note that you talked about um, a beginner just starting, yeah. right? It's totally different than like, I could put 20 pounds of muscle on in a month right now. Well, you because you got that muscle memory. That, yeah. Right. Because I, I'm way under what I've- You've had it before. Yeah, I've had way more muscle on my body than I have currently right mm -hmm. now. I'm nowhere near dialed in either both consistency training or eating. Yeah, if you went super aggressive- If I turned, bulk, if I turned it on and was perfect over the next month, I could I could shift my weight. To, and that's what we see a lot of times on these advertising, this bullshit. That's why I wanted to bring it up, mm -hmm. is because you'll see someone like me who's got 20 years plus of training, has built his body up to the, the pinnacle of bodybuilding physique- and then is now kind of falling out of shape in comparison to that. And, and I'm significantly, my muscle mass is probably somewhere around 180, maybe even 170 right now. You mean and I've been as, lean body mass? Right? Yeah, lean body mass. And I've been as high as 205 in lean body mass, even a little bit higher than that. I think 210 when I was Oh, at, at the very peak. least, you could add 10 pounds of lean body mass in a month. Like that. Yeah. Like yeah. that. Because I had it before. So right. that's, mm -hmm. and so when you see those, those transformations mm -hmm. like that, you you and you don't know all those factors. You have to. And it, it wasn't the supplement he took. Yeah. It wasn't the workout routine necessarily that he did. It's just that you have to factor all that stuff. But yeah, in. that first year, the numbers I gave earlier is if you do everything right, you'll probably fall. And I say probably because some people will be less. Some people might be a little more. Most people will be somewhere in the middle of what I said. You'll probably fall within that range. The second year. Far less. So if you gained, you know, 13 pounds of, of lean body mass and you're a man that first year and you did everything right and you're not a teenage kid where you're going to gain weight anyway or whatever, um, that next year you might do three pounds or four pounds of lean body. Then the third year, maybe a couple pounds or none. And then after that, it's a struggle for every pound of lean body mass. And for a woman, you know, same thing that first year. Most of my female clients, if they did everything right, I'd be able to put a good five, six pounds of lean body mass on them in that first, like real pure lean body mass, not mm -hmm. body fat, water, but actual in that first year. Now I've, I've also, there are genetic anomalies out there. I mean, I've seen, I've, I've only trained a couple that I could really say are, Ooh, these are genetic freaks where the muscle just, but that's not the average yeah, person. So no, don't expect not, that. No, but I think the thing that's encouraging and, and why I was bringing up my point of being able to swing my, my muscle mass that fast now is that. The the over year what and what that is is that you know at one point I probably had one of that that hyper growth years where I put on ten to fifteen pounds of muscle and then it for every year after that it was you know five more than five yeah. more than five more than five more and then here I am at forty years old and I've been all the way up to two hundred and thirty five two hundred forty pounds and and I can now drop all the way down to one ninety two hundred pounds and lose a ton of muscle but then I can get it back really quick. Yeah. So even though it took years and years and years and years and years to, to, to add on three to five more pounds, three to five more pounds, but once your, your body has, has carried that, that, that lean mass before, obtaining it again gets easier and easier mm -hmm. as you get older. So there's, even though it's a slow process initially to build all that muscle mass, there's, uh, it gets better as you get older. Next question is from Two Rash. Can you explain carb cycling and its benefits? Can you fat cycle as well? So carb cycling is really popular among stage presentation athletes like bodybuilders and physique competitors and bikini competitors. I loved it. And they the they tout it because they say it's effective for fat burning or you burn more body fat doing it. 
that's not why I think it's uh, effective. I think it has more to do with the psychological effects of carb cycling because, first off, cutting carbs for calories to reduce your calories, in my experience, especially when you're tracking everything and you're you know lifting weights and all that stuff, it's easier than cutting fat and definitely easier than cutting protein. You don't want to cut protein. And fat can be a little bit challenging to really cut because it's more satiating than carbs. So people tend to mess with carbs. Carbs are also non-essential. You can get rid of them completely. It's not going to kill you. You can't do that with fat and with protein. So why do they cycle it? Well, higher carb days give you more energy. Your muscles fill out. You're stronger. You feel good in the gym. You get a better pump. When you drop the carbs, you lose weight. You look skinnier. Maybe you look leaner because you've got less water, but then you're weaker, less energy. And so rather than always going low carb or always going a particular way, you cycle and they tend to try to target harder workouts with more carbs and they try to, and you get to also satisfy that mental feeling of like, you know, when you call, when you cut your calories, especially if you're, you know, body conscious and you don't like losing muscle, you cut your calories and you cut your carbs. You feel like you're shrinking that little carb up is a nice, Oh, I feel better. Here's my pump. Oh, I can see that what's, what's working on my body. So that's, one of the main reasons why I think it's beneficial. I 100% agree with you. The, the main thing is the psychological piece. And you're right. A lot of bodybuilders will try and make the case with insul what's going on with insulin. Yeah. And, and it, what it, what's really going on more than anything is every third to fourth day, depending on what your carb cycle looks like, you get to refeed. Yeah. Is that what yours was when you were? So I actually I actually played around with that. So that was, that was the other thing I thought was really funny is there was kind of like this traditional way of every third day there was like a, a, a low carb day a medium carb day then a high carb day oh, it's kind of like the traditional and i understood the science behind what was really going on and so there's nothing that stops you from going low low medium high or medium medium low high like you can play with it and all and i did i, I mess with all different ways and I really like the fourth day being the refeed. I could I like to push my I could push my body a little bit further on on the low calorie and then I would refeed on the fourth day. I always tried to schedule it around like a big muscle group that I was training whether that was legs yeah. or back or something like that. Like so I wanted my 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 maximal strength and calorie surplus at that time. So I, I think it's the psychological part. When you're when you're dieting for an extended period of time where you have to be in a caloric deficit and if you have the same macros, the same everything day in and day out, it just it gets it gets laborious and it gets tough to stick to forever. Where <coughs> with the carb cycle, it just gives you a break in the diet. It feels like mm. you you get like the all of a sudden you get this day where you get a, a, an excess amount of carbs in comparison to the previous two or three or four days, and it feels good and it's it's a nice little break. Um, I don't like, although you could calorie wise cycle fat, I think it's a bad strategy. I think most that's people, mostly, it's just calorie cycling at that yeah, point. Well, yeah. yeah. And it's essential. Like you said, yeah, fat and protein, fat, fat and protein is essential. The reason why they carb cycle carbs is because not essential. You, there's less, uh, there's less room for error when you're cycling fat. Or if you were to cycle, you go too low on fat, you're affecting your health yeah. and you're affecting yeah, you're gonna affect you can potentially affect hormones and you're not you're not gonna feel good and like it's and fat's very satiating in comparison in comparison to carbohydrates. So I think it feels better to to reduce the carbohydrates than it would do to reduce fat, which actually helps you stay satiated. And you're, when you're in a caloric deficit, you want to try and feel as as much satiated as you can when you're most of the time going to. I 100 percent agree. I only did this. I've done this a few times when I've gotten really lean, and I like to do. I only go. I would do low, low, medium, and then I had have one high carb day. And the reason why I didn't do it more frequently. Because I, for me at least, noticed that when I had the high, first off, obviously the next day I had great workouts, great pumps, but when I would do it, it would set my appetite off. And then I'd have like a day or two afterwards where I'm like fighting my appetite. So I'm like, I don't want to do this every three days because this can be really hard. So to that's the greatest challenge with the carb cycle is the is the discipline after the refeed to not, because you're that, that the next day is the hardest day. Because you you now give this refeed and it re-kicks up that appetite again. And, yeah. then, you, and then you have this, and by the way, it's also psychologically challenging because you feel better and you look better better after refeed. So a lot of guys go like, oh, I'll do another day. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then, yeah. then, they, then next thing you know, you're back in a calorie surplus. Yeah. You're no longer in a deficit anymore. So if you have the mental discipline to understand what is going on with the body, why you feel that way, why you look that way, um, I liked it. I, and it, I've had a lot of success. Uh, it's typically if I were to go into a like real aggressive fat loss or uh, cut right now, um, I would lean towards a carb cycle. I would first... Uh, the first steps would be 
figuring out my my balance because I have no idea what my caloric maintenance is right now, not exactly what it is. I would first just track and see where my maintenance is. Then once I figure out my my calorie maintenance, I would I would start off with an even ratio of carbohydrates and fats because it's just nice and balanced and then hitting my protein intake. And then after I've got another week or so of that, I would go, okay, now let's start manipulating mm -hmm. carbohydrates and calories. And now, I would start to cycle. Yeah, I was always curious to kind of ask you guys because I didn't mess with any of this stuff really. You do cheese cycling, it's right? It's cheese cycling. <laughs> I don't cycle. I just keep it in the mix. Yeah, it's, no, I mean, different. He's cheese. always yeah, on the yeah, cheese bulk. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe like variety. I'll, yeah, cycle, right. I'll cycle the variety. But uh, it, the the whole concept of like carb front loading, carb back loading yeah. and all that. Like I, remember, I play with all that too. Okay. So That's explain like carbs that. Carbs early in the day, I, yeah. Yeah. carbs late in the day. Mm -hmm. carbs, and again, well, what's I, the benefits? In, in so, okay. So again, here's another, another thing where we like to take a little bit of science and we run with it. And then we try and make the case again. A lot and of if someone what, likes it, it's a psychological. It is, exactly. They try and make the case for the insulin levels and then like your body wanting to recover through the night and rest. And that's when you should really be fueling it. So that's why you backload carbohydrates, blah, blah, blah. And then blah. other people are like, no, don't raise I've insulin. Heard you that and I was always skeptical. Yeah, like, all, it's, yeah, to me, all that stuff is, is is all a bunch of bullshit, and you're splitting hairs on the difference of it. And it's really like, what will you adhere to, and what do you like the yep. most? And I and and I played with both. And the things that I I didn't like about the backloading the carbohydrates is I needed uh, I shouldn't say I needed. I felt better in my workouts when I front loaded my carbohydrates. Yeah. When I and I've told this on the podcast before. I've told you guys. This is where I had, you and I are different. I had it to a yeah. I had it to a gram. Like I knew that seventy five grams of carbohydrates. If I had once I intake that, I had the the best workouts like that for my body. Then like it's probably different now. But then by if I had about seventy five grams in, um, I, it wasn't too much and it was just the right amount for me to have, fuel an amazing workout. So if I backloaded carbs. And let's say it's a, a day where I'm only eating 100 grams of carbs. That means I'm none in breakfast, none in lunch. Most of it's going to be happening in the late evening mm -hmm. meal and dinner. And I already had my workout at noon. So my workouts would suck. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is where you and I are different. I liked eating if I had a higher carb day at, in the evening because I slept better. I would sleep better, mm -hmm. sleep better and have a big meal in the evening. And I like to work out more, you know, relatively fasted. Um, that's where you went. But well, again, you it's also, all psychological. So, yeah, but here's the thing, though. You're... You're not backloading as much as you think, and I'm not frontloading as much as you think because our workout times are so different. You train really early in the morning. Right. So, so if you load it up on carbohydrates good point. late at night, good point. it's actually, and you don't move, of it's a front fueling load. that. Yeah, yeah you're, right. he's fueled up for his morning yeah. morning breakfast or morning lift, which yeah. makes a lot of sense why you, probably, why you like that. And mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense why someone who like me who trained at two o'clock in the afternoon, why I wanted the carbohydrates in the front. And to me- that is what matters more than what the the argument that the the, the geeks like to try and make of like what's going on with insulin and right. growth hormone and all that bullshit. It's like, yeah, come on, makes it's, sense. it's like where when do you work out? Because if I have a shitty workout, I'm le I'm less likely to to push the intensity to hit mm. hit PRs to finish the workout. And well, that, when you're you want to time out your easily accessible energy source. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and when you're training at that level where it's your job. Like you're competing, it's your job. You you want to do everything you can to make your workout as perfect as possible, and so that you know. But I love talking yeah. about that stuff because these are all things I played with. All that stuff, I had, you know, four years of being fanatical about this stuff. I, every everything you can think of that that some bodybuilder guy has pushed or talked about, I have manipulated and played with, mm. and then like it took my own like okay. I see why some people like this. I understand mm -hmm. why that like they and and Sal says this a lot, right? Like we just. We've done a really, the, it's it's got a bad name of bro science because the way they communicate it, because mm. they try and communicate it with insulin levels and growth hormone. They try and sound really smart about it when it's just like, okay, that's splitting hairs, what we're really talking about. What's really more important is tell me how you felt when that's you, it, when right. you, at the way, did that's you get it. a good ass workout from it? Did you feel really good mm. from it? Because from a calorie perspective, it's the same damn thing. Same thing. Right. Whether you eat your 70, your 75 grabs at breakfast or you have it at dinner, if it all equates out to the same amount of calories, then from a fat burning perspective, it's pretty much the same damn thing. Mm. So that all that bullshit is out the window. It really becomes, was that? Can you be more consistent with that? And do, are your totally. workouts good with that? Next question is from I love t-shirt time more than he does. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's his favorite time of the week. <laughs> is there a set point for our weight? You know, uh, yes and no. Okay, so here's the yes part. You do have a genetic size. Uh, obviously, Justin, Adam, myself, Doug, we're a certain height. There's a certain, I'm sure, genetic limit to how much we can gain in terms of weight or lose and all that stuff. So in that sense, yes. Now here's the sense where it says no. They're, they've mm. used this to sell people on the fact that 
you're not going to lose weight. You're not going to do it. You know, it's not effective because your body has a body weight it wants to be at, yeah. and that's the bottom line. It's like a pain point thing. It's like not here's your here's your limitation. Not true. Obesity really is a new problem. What did all of a sudden we evolve the last couple generations to be super obese? No, that's just our lifestyle. So, the set point that people fight with now is really just their behavior and their lifestyles. So we tend to go back to the behaviors and lifestyles that we're most used to. So when you lose 20 pounds, how do you do it? You change your behaviors. You change your lifestyle. That's how you lose a 20 pounds. Why do you gain it back? You go back to your old lifestyle, and which takes you back to your old body weight. That's where that comes from. But it's not this like this block where it's like, well, hey, I can't, you know, I can't lose 50 pounds because my body won't let me. It's my set point. No matter what I do, my metabolism will adjust and my body's gonna work itself in a way. No, no, that's just your behaviors, John. You just got to fix your behaviors yeah, yeah. and then you're going to end up. Well, it yeah. really depends. Like, I've heard this question asked by, by uh, several different types of clients. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're the, uh, the fat loss client that is really struggling with weight loss and you're, you know, a hundred pounds or whatever, you're way overweight. doesn't matter how much. Uh, and, and you're curious, do I have this set point? The, the answer that Sal just gave is, is spot on. It's the way I would communicate it to, to that client. Then I also get it sometimes from like the person who's trying to build muscle, like the young kid who's trying to add a bunch of muscle and is wondering like, am I just genetically screwed? I'll never be this buff guy. Well, you, you'll probably never be Arnold Schwarzenegger if you have this kind of ectomorph type of body, some anotype, and you are really, really lean. Like you're probably not going to get all the way up there. We have unless you use probably anabolic steroids. Even then, though. Uh, yeah, and even then, probably not right. But and we have uh, what's the name of the calculator that we have for uh, your muscle potential? Oh, that's mm -hmm. on our uh, because there is there is a there is a I think mapsmacro.com will have a link. To so it. there is yeah. a generic number that we all have that is your natural, uh, you know, potential. muscle potential, muscle potential. Yeah. Uh, very few people are there. Okay, most of us have unless you've been lifting for decades consistently, um, you probably haven't reached that. But yeah, there is a there is a point where your skeletal system is, is is not naturally going to want to put on any more muscle without using drugs. Mm -hmm. That it's going to say this is kind of the nat. So if you're asking me about set point for that, that's kind of where I'm going with yeah. that conversation. Is I'm going to explain muscle potential and that yeah, we have we do have kind of a, a limit there. Very few young people have come anywhere near it yet, mm -hmm. uh, so I wouldn't be worried about that. But then then there's the the fat loss community that wants to use the set point thing and that was well, your, your body point. is just very good about um, finding its way to homeostasis and, and trying to regulate everything so it thrives in the environment you present it with so you know a lot of a lot of the change has to be a constant uh, staying ahead of the curve of of you know what your what stimulus you're applying to your body and so being consistent is definitely the, the biggest factor to that in terms of like you're reaching closer to your potential which most people don't even get close yeah because it's the, the consistency is the hardest thing but if you're talking to somebody that's been consistent for years and years and years but hasn't then also applied different stimulus different concepts taken their body and challenged it in in a variety of different ways uh, you know, then that's also another way that you can kind of maybe like squeeze out even more uh, from your body. But it's the thing is you're always kind of battling your body's natural inclination to kind of bring things into its optimal. Like this is where we're 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 best at. Yeah, the, the problem is that is the question is point as if there's a point. It's not. It's a range. Yeah, right. You and have it's a moving a lot. You have a ge you have <laughs> yeah. a genetic range. You change all the okay. time. You have a genetic range for intelligence. You have a genetic range for how good you're going to be at basketball or chess or how fast you can run or how much weight you can gain or how much weight you can lose, and it's a big range. Now, what determines whether or not you're in the middle or on one extreme or the extreme? Your lifestyle. Now, mm -hmm. I'm. I have a range. For intelligence, it's different than Einstein's range was for intelligence. So can I achieve the types of uh, feats of intelligence that Einstein had? No. But I have a potential, and I probably haven't reached that potential, right? And I probably have a potential for obesity and muscle mass and health or poor health, and it's your lifestyle that dictates that. So I would say the more accurate way to ask this question is, is there a set range for our weight in mm -hmm. which case, yes, but that range is pretty damn massive. Like, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure I could get my body weight down to 120 pounds 
if I really starve myself. And I'm pretty sure if I really pushed it, I could get my body weight up to you know, maybe 300 pounds if I really pushed it. So let's just say that's my range, right? Well, how do I determine where I land within there? That's my lifestyle. Next question is from Brett Richards, 87. What are some training tips with a newborn? Yeah, I would start with really lightweight. They're not very strong or stable <laughs> at that age. Yeah. Really support the head. <laughs> really support the head as they're doing yeah, yeah. lunges. Yeah. Yeah. Don't use probably them. not teaching deadlifts yet. Don't, probably don't, weigh a little don't, bit longer. Don't use them like a shake weight. Yeah, really don't shake it. Yes. No, so, <laughs> not good. So obviously, the question is uh, as for the dad. I yeah, assume, right? I'm about to have a newborn. Shit, I got like I got like three, three little like three months oh, before I goodness. got another one. I know. Well, I tell you what. Okay, that's such Bro. a great point. And one of the best things that you did was you've built one of the the best physiques you've had heading into it mm -hmm. yeah so i can so, so i'm gonna let myself go way down <laughs> well, to like normal i mean <laughs> i mean the truth is though i mean that's that's the I mean, that's you the, ride it out from here dude. That, that's a good strategy uh, not that i think you should you know and not that you will either i know you like you're not gonna like all of a sudden oh fucking write it off yeah. but the fact that you have have pushed and been as consistent as you have been with your diet and your training uh, to to get your physique to the level that it's at right now, boy, it gives you a lot more latitude. It does. I remember you like, did that with when you had Max. Yeah, so same thing. Yeah. yeah, it gave me a lot more latitude to kind of not yeah. stress if I didn't get a lifting day this week. Yeah, you know? I'd say the keys to to consistency or training when you have anything in your life that makes it very challenging to be consistent with anything, which a newborn is got to be one of the most uh, challenging things. They're so demanding, right? Uh, especially on mom, but can be on dad too. I think the key is. That uh, short, small workouts, uh, when available, is a really good strategy. I like having a home gym or something like a suspension trainer or something where 10 minute bouts, I could go and do yep. two or three sets of an exercise whenever available versus I have an hour workout scheduled at these times because inevitably something's, it's going to get in the way. It's going to be very, very difficult um, to do so. The other thing is, if you have a willing partner that you both schedule a couple workouts you do on your own and the other partner agrees, okay, your workouts are Tuesday and Thursday at this time, mine are Monday and Friday at this time, you watch the baby, I watch the baby, and then you kind of make that happen. But And then the third thing is acceptance. Accept the fact that uh, mm -hmm. you know whatever can go wrong will go wrong. You're going to miss stuff and you got to be okay with that. That's a tough one for me because uh, it can be really hard. I like, to I like the short routine. workout hack. I mean, that's just one of those things where you, you alleviate a lot of the pressure of, of that feeling of like, I didn't get a good workout in, you yeah. know? So what, where's the value? Um, and, and to kind of string that out a bit to where you, you, you take it now into chunks of like, you know, five to 15 minutes, like whatever you have available, you know, that day, you look at it as an everyday thing instead of like, I'm doing three days a week, I'm going yeah. to the gym for you. Know, and I have these days in between where I'm kind of resting, whatever. Like, no, this is just like, if I have a moment, I'm just going to find my way over to the equipment and I'm just going to get some reps in. Uh, and then, yeah, everything else, you kind of have to kind of concede the fact that <laughs> you're, uh, a lot of, uh, what you want to happen is like, you just got to throw that out the door and just be cool with, you know, being flexible and riding it out. I mean, I think your guys' advice is spot on both. Um, and Sal really, uh, all the things that you suggested as possibilities actually all happened for me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And so I think that's another thing too, is like, um, it, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to look the same every week. Like there was times where uh, Katrina and I actually, you know, bring, and we still do this, bring Max into the garage and we're working mm -hmm. out as like a family together. And like, he's actually yeah. occupied kind of playing mm -hmm. and doing his thing. Like you can do that. They got a little pack and play. You can throw it, throw them in and do that. We used to bring him down to the gym. Everyone. So sometimes we got an actual full hour workout and we would kind of, you know, if he needed a diaper change, I would go handle it while she did a set. And then if she, he was being, he wanted attention, she would go give him mm -hmm. attention. Then I would do And we kind of went ping pong for an hour and a half to two hours in the gym. That was sometimes, sometimes a workout like that. Then there was other times when it was just get it where you can. And sometimes that meant I got three sets of squats. That was my workout yeah. for the day and be okay with that. I think that it, and if, and if you, it's not forever either, by the way, it's right. It's, you're talking about six months to a, a year period. tops yeah. by you, by the time they're a year and they're walking and they're, they're, they're playing like yeah. it's, it's a whole different ball. I always say that the first six months was like the twilight zone. And then you're like, you kind of start to see the light, the tunnel, eight months, nine months. And then one year, it's like, that was when it got really fun. And I really, really enjoyed mm -hmm. fatherhood was hitting the one year and beyond. So I think the, 
The thing you got to be most careful with, and I think is the most important piece of advice. I know this is regarding working out, but the truth is that's not where you're going to lose. And where you're going. It's going to be the nutrition and yeah. the lack of sleep is going to make that really challenging, right? So what happens when you when you get poor sleep, it really ramps those cravings up. And you're also kind of sedentary and you're not moving around. And so it's real easy. You start to have the fuck it attitude. Yes. You start to have the fuck it yeah. attitude. You start to make bad food choices. And that's what will really backslide you. That's what's really going to make you fall out of shape is not only missing your workouts, but then also craving all these bad foods and indulging on this stuff and then also not moving around. Down. So being cognizant of that and knowing that, hey, I'm probably not exercising and moving as often as intensely. So I really need to rein in my habits and behaviors around nutrition and keep that tight. That is going to take you a long way. Yeah, the diet is where I see the biggest uh, for challenge. sure for myself, especially it's going to be the diet because a workout is a workout. That's 30 minutes or an hour. You eat all day long. I mean, eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, maybe snacks. And that's when you're at home and you're with the baby and you're tired. And it's like, yeah, I'll have some cookies. Yeah, let's order some DoorDash. Yeah, let's and wife is tired. You're tired, so maybe you're not yeah, we're making. Not cooking. You're not cooking and prepping your meals, so you're eating yep. out. So you know you got to make better choices. But and you know, some here's some um, I guess some words of encouragement. The, the amount of training that you need to do to keep or at least maintain muscle and strength is way less mm -hmm. than whatever it took to gain. So you know the whole like leading into it with by training hard. It's kind of a strategy because whatever you build going into it. You know, let's say I work out five days a week for an hour, uh, five days a week. And now I'm in this situation where I don't, I can't train nearly as much. Well, two days a week will probably keep everything that I gained or I'll lose very little, right? With just two days a week. So keep that in mind as well. However long that season is, which could be anywhere from six months to a year, um, you don't need to train a lot to kind of keep what you've built or, or at the very, at, at the least, you'll lose a little bit, not much. I'm not going to go way in the other The diet will be the most important thing because where you would fall off big time and the lose diet. a lot is if you don't hit your protein intake, you're eating, you're, you're, you're intaking, you're over consuming oh, on yeah. calories, right? So you're over consuming carbohydrates and fat, you under consume on protein and your volume of training gr grossly reduce. Then you could see a massive swing yep. in what your physique will end up looking like as a, as a new dad right now. Whereas if you just keep the keep the diet in check, hit your protein intake, and then make an effort to touch touch some weights, you know, as frequently as you can throughout the week, but don't beat yourself up if you don't get those like Justin's saying those regimen hour routine three days a week. It doesn't gotta look like that, you know. Just touch some weights and be good about eat the way you eat and don't overconsume, and you'd be surprised how much you'll be able to maintain. Excellent. Look, if you like our show, if you like our advice, go to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with any fitness goal, fat loss, muscle gain, mobility. We have guides for personal trainers too. It's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. How do I incorporate cardio and not lose muscle? I've seen people do this before where they'll start to lose the sharpness of their muscles or they'll start to lose the sculpt a little bit. And that's disheartening. But if you do it right, then you minimize that muscle loss or that metabolism slowdown. In fact, if you do it right, you can actually speed up your metabolism at the same time that you build stamina and endurance. You just have to be able to kind of program it properly. And the way to program it improperly is just to go do as much cardio as you can for as long as you can. Right.